Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to see each of you here. Um, and we look forward to what the Lord's going to do in this place today. So pray as we go. Sing and honor him with your voices. And let's worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that in him we have redemption. And I pray that each of you, if you have not experienced that redemption, today would be that day. I encourage you, sing with us. I will sing of my Redeemer. Would you stand? You shall love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And this morning we need you to worship the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. Welcome to Sunday morning worship here at First Baptist Church of Morgan City. We're delighted to see you here. Thank you for joining us and thank you for making this worship service a part of your weekend. If you're visiting with us for the first time or if it's been a while, take the time during the course of this uh service and fill out one of the visitors information cards uh, turn that into myself or uh, someone at the end of the service we'd love to see you and welcome you and thank you those of you tuning in through facebook live thank you for joining in we hope that you are well and we are praying for you uh, of course the big thing that we have going on in the upcoming weeks is vacation bible school if you can't tell by the banners and the placards out front that is coming uh, a week from tomorrow, we will start that. So this is all hands on deck. This is an opportunity for everybody to be involved in what's going on. Uh, one of the biggest outreach opportunities that we have throughout the year. So uh, through this week, we'll be going uh, through the neighborhoods, uh, putting some door hangers on neighborhood houses, inviting people. Uh, the biggest thing that you can help with is to just let others know. When you see those social media posts come up, about Vacation Bible School, they can go and register online on the website or the link provided through social media. But we're delighted to be here this morning. We're looking forward to what the Lord has to say and do through us. Uh, I hope he speaks to you through the songs and through the message. Uh, just look around. Uh, there are people who are not here. Uh, there are some are out sick, some are traveling, some are on the road. 
pray for them, call and check on them. And uh, as we get ready for the upcoming weeks, we'll be praying about uh, the Lord moving here at First Baptist Church and the lives of our family and the kids that will be here for Vacation Bible School. Uh, we also have a team coming in from the Louisiana Baptist Convention. It is the GOLA team. We had some here last year that helped us out. They are trained in the curriculum. There are some gift bags on the front pew. Uh, if you would like to make a donation, a gift card or something homemade, uh, something with Louisiana flair or local uh, hospitality, uh, make them feel at home. I've been told it's, it's all females this year, so chocolate. They like chocolate. They love chocolate. Anything chocolate is going to go a long way with this group. So uh, we're looking forward to working with them. They're going to be a blessing, and uh, we're looking forward to what the Lord has to say uh, during the message this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll continue in worship. Father God, we love you so much, and this morning, Lord God, we just open our hearts to you. You have us here for a reason today, Lord God, and you have us here in this service for a reason. So I pray that you'll speak to us, Lord God. First of all, Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that you would speak directly to their heart. And if it is a person, Lord God, that has been born again, if there's someone here uh, that maybe is just not serving you in the capacity that they've been called or created to do, I pray that, Lord God, your Holy Spirit would empower them and bring them to the point to where they're willing to fully surrender to you and that something in this service would enable them to be able to better communicate the gospel to the lost world around them. We love you, Lord, and we're looking forward to what you're going to do. I pray for our vacation Bible school, Lord God, as the uh, GOLA team comes in. I pray that you'll begin preparing them and equipping them, seeing them here safely, Lord God. And I just pray that through the week you'll give them the energy and the guidance that they need uh, to continue teaching the gospel to a generation that may not know you, Lord God. I pray that uh, by the end of the week that each and every kid here, each and every family here, will be, be connected to you in a way that they weren't before, Lord. And we're looking forward to what you're going to do in this service. We turn it all over to you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As we continue, 1 John 1, 7 tells us that the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. All. We don't have to worry once we trust Jesus he purifies us from all. Let's sing, Are You Washed in the Blood? These men are loving these, these songs this morning because they have a little extra part in there, and that really speaks volumes. So I hope you're enjoying it like I am. And some 
chapter 94, verse 22, the scripture tells us, my God is the rock of my refuge. He's, he's my rock. He is my all in all. He is my everything. This is our offertory. Would you stand as we sing Rock of Ages? so much to be thankful for. We thank you first of all and most of all for Jesus our Savior. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of being able to come into your house, hear your word proclaimed, and, and worship you as we see fit without it, and enjoy the freedoms that we have in this country. We thank you for all you do. I thank you for Brother Tracy and his leadership, what he means to us, what he means to me. Lord, I ask that you'd be with the ones that are not here this morning for whatever reason, Lord, that you'd just keep them safe, keep them close. I ask that you'd be with the ones that are here, Lord, and if there's someone here today that has not accepted Jesus today, it might be today. We ask, Lord, that you'd draw us all closer together and closer to you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. And, Lord, as we bring these tithes and offerings, we just ask they'll be used in your will. Thank you for, again for all you've done. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.
if you're following your bulletins, just skip that part right now. Because I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn to hymn 329. And let's sing, Great is thy faithfulness. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 says, Where sin abound, grace increased all the more. That doesn't give us a free ticket. That just lets you know that his grace is greater than our sins. Well, now you can officially say that at one time, your pastor was part of a men's quartet. <laughs> Add that to my resume, huh? It was a joy and a privilege worshiping with you guys. Thank you for being here. If you have your Bibles this morning, we'll be in Psalms chapter 106. We are moving through. Uh, the articles of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 started a few weeks ago and spent several weeks on the doctrine of the scriptures. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, while we are going through this, uh, what we're looking at, what we're studying, what is the purpose behind it? Well, uh, basically, so you'll know uh, what we believe as a Southern Baptist Convention church. 
so you'll know what I believe as your pastor, and hopefully it'll raise some questions about uh, how you believe and where you stand in your faith as well. And so uh, we've looked at the doctrine of the scriptures, we looked at the doctrine of man, we looked at uh, the doctrine of God, what we believe, who we believe God is, our purpose for being here. Today we look at the doctrine of salvation, Article 4 of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Like I said, if you want all of the articles and all the sub-articles that come along with them, there's a booklet out in the foyer. You can pick one of those up. Uh, look at that. The, the actual doctrine, the article that we're looking at today is on the back side of your outline uh, that was included in your bulletin. And it simply states this. It says, salvation involves the redemption of the whole man and is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who by his own blood obtained eternal redemption for the believer. In its broadest sense, salvation included regeneration, justification, sanctification, glorification. There is no salvation apart from a personal faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And so the booklet that contains the whole article uh, each sub point of it includes the parts of regeneration, justification, sanctification, and glorification. So if you wanted to look at your salvation as one whole picture, you could uh, put it into three different station, uh, stages. Salvation past, the day you were saved, the day you were born again, salvation present, what you are going through now, the sanctification process, and salvation future, your glorification, the day that you will be taken up either by death or at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is your glorify, that is when you will receive your glorified body. So salvation comes past, present, and future. Now it's going to take me a little while to get to each one of our points in the outline. We're going to go through um, the book of Exodus and we're going to paint a picture of what the psalmist is talking about here in Psalms 106. So if you have your Bibles and you're open to Psalms, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Beginning in verse 1, the psalmist writes this, it says, Praise the Lord. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all His praise? Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. O visit me with your salvation. Now, if you remember our passage from Psalm 8 last week on the doctrine of man, that's the same thing the psalmist said. Who am I that you would visit with me? And so he's asking that same question again. Would you please visit me with your salvation? And there's a reason for that, he says, so that I may see the benefits of of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. And so there's a story in the back of the psalmist's mind that he is wanting to paint a picture of. And we're going to get into those steps whenever we get into verse 6. But verse 8 is where we'll actually pick up on each one of the points that are in the outline. He says this, he says, We have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, just like us, nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. If you ever wonder why God saved you, redeemed you, and purchased you with the blood of his own son. There it is right there. For his glory and for his own name's sake. That he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also and it dried up. So he led them through the depths. As through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them. And redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. And if you notice, he says, then, after all of those great and mighty works, it was only then that they feared him and believed his words. 
and sang his praise. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you for this incredible story, this reflection we have on the great and mighty works that you did for your people, Lord God, and their deliverance. And we just pray, Lord God, as we relive that story, as we go back through each step of their salvation process, we pray that we learn how to apply it to our lives, Lord God. We thank you that it is through your Son alone that we are saved. We thank you that it is by your mighty grace, but it is through faith, Lord God, that we can reach out and we can grab hold of that salvation that you have provided for us. And I trust, Lord God, that if there's anyone here that does not know you, if there's anyone who has not experienced your great salvation, that today would be that day that they would experience it for the first time. For those of us who are saved, Lord God, I pray that there would be something in this lesson, something in this message, something in this passage that would help us to be able to explain clearly the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to those around us. We just ask all of these things in your most precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So this story that the psalmist is reflecting on is told numerous times throughout Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament. In the Psalms, it's reflected on numerous times. On the day of Pentecost, Peter went back and revisited the children of Israel, their rebellion, their deliverance from Pharaoh and Egypt. The book of Hebrews, it goes over it multiple times. So let's go back and let's examine this story a little bit closer. If you'll turn with me to the book of Exodus we're going to look at exactly what the psalmist was painting a picture of in this song that he created, this poem that he created. What are the points? What were the things that he was talking about, about God's deliverance and God's saving them from and God's saving them for? Step one, we see that salvation typically begins with a cry for help. If you want to write these down somewhere on your outline, uh, step one typically involves a cry for help. For 400 years, the children of Israel had been enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt. And so Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, it says this. It says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of their bondage. And they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and acknowledged them. Now Moses had already been born. Moses was grown up as a prince of Egypt because they had adopted him. He became the, the son of the princess. She raised him up. He was next in line. Uh, he was a prince of Egypt, but he was also called out by God to be a deliverer. These people that were enslaved in Egypt, they didn't know where their deliverance was going to come from. But in that time of their bondage, in that time that they were trapped, they knew they weren't completing the work that God had for them. They knew they weren't living their purpose. They knew they weren't living life. They knew that they shouldn't be enslaved. And so Egypt is always a picture of sin. The children of Israel enslaved in Egypt, they're a picture of us held in bondage by our sinful nature. And so it says here in the book of Exodus that because of their bondage, they were groaning and they cried out to God, God save us. And it says that God heard their groaning and he responded to it. That's how the Lord is with our prayers at all times. The Bible says that the eyes, are o the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. And multiple times in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now this was just the first step. There was a lot of things that had to come into place for their overall salvation to happen. But step one began with a cry for help. Step number two, God had to provide a deliverer. So Moses was working for his father Jethro on the backside of the wilderness, tending his sheep when he has his burning bush experience. As we move into chapter three, beginning in verse seven, we see 
that their deliverer is called out. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. He's talking to Moses here. I've seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a land, a large land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and Perizzites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. And he tells Moses, he says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So all throughout his life, Moses has been prepared for this day. God hears the cries of his people that are in bondage. And now God goes to Moses. He says, Moses, you're going to be the one who delivers my people out of their sin, out of their slavery in Egypt. I want you to be my deliverer for this great exodus event that is about to happen. So God is setting the stage. Step three. We go all the way to chapter 12. Moses confronts Pharaoh. He tells him plagues are going to come to his land time and time again. God puts these uh, plagues on Egypt, but he doesn't put them on the Israelites. He protects them from each and every one of them. When we come down to the last plague, God says, this is it. This is going to be the last one. And he says, for this last plague, for you to be protected, you need to take some critical steps. So step number one, it begins with a cry for help. Step number two begins with a deliverer being sent to the people. Step number three begins with following God's directions. So God says, here's what you're to do. The angel of the death is going to come on a night. But if you want to be protected from this angel of death, here's what you need to do. And he lays out the elements of the first Passover ever. But the crucial step of the entire Passover was to take a lamb. And it couldn't just be any lamb. It had to be a spotless, unblemished lamb. Firstborn of the herd. Step number one in this process, he says, here's what you've got to do. You've got to follow my directions if you want to survive this final plague. He says, because I'm going to strike down all the firstborn of the Egyptians. But if you'll follow my steps, it will not happen to you and your household. First of all, he says, every man, the household, uh, the leader of every household is to take an unblemished lamb. Number two, he says, your lamb must be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or the, uh, or the goats. Step number three, he says, you are to slaughter this lamb. And you're to take the blood and you're to strike the doorpost and the lintel of your home. He said, and then you're to consume the rest of the lamb. You're to roast it for your Passover meal. So he gives these specific directions for the people to follow, for him to protect them from this last plague. Step number four, they had to trust in this sacrificial provision that God was instructing them on. And if you look in chapter 12, verse 13, you see the most important step of all. Once the blood had been applied to the doorposts and the lentils, he says, here's what's going to happen. When the angel of death comes around, he's going to go to house to house. But here's the key step. There was one thing and one thing only that God was looking for. He says, and when I see the blood... I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So everyone in the household, they had to be in the household, and the head of the household had to take the blood of the lamb, strike the doorpost and the lintel to cover that whole family with the blood of that sacrificial lamb. And God says, when I see the blood, I'll know that you obeyed me. You followed my directions. And now you are trusting in my 
provisions. Step number five, after you've cried out to the Lord for help, after God has provided a deliverer, after you have followed God's directions, and after you have trusted in his sacrificial provision, next you've got to follow the Lord where he leads you. Follow the Lord with all of your heart and never go back to what he has delivered you from. Over in chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, the angel of the death went from house to house, those that survive, God says, gather your belongings, it's time to go. Pharaoh's going to release you, and that's exactly what he did. Pharaoh said, you know what, I can't take any more. My son has died. The firstborn of my entire nation has died. I want you Israelites out of my country. Go. You are no longer enslaved to me. And so God said, take up your belongings. Let's get out of here. He says, but I'm going to direct you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to come down and you're going to visibly see where I'm at. And wherever I am, that is where you are to go. You are to follow me. And in chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, it says, So they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them in that way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. He says, I want your eyes fixed on me, so I'm going to give you a visible sign. During the day, I'm going to be a cloud. During the night, I'm going to be a pillar of fire. You're going to be able to see me, and everywhere I go, I want you to follow me because I'm going to direct you in the path that you are to go in for your deliverance. He says, and when you're following me, don't look back. Don't be tempted to go back from what I have set you free from because you're not ever going to go that way again. I'm going to lead you in a new direction that you've never been to before. He says, I want you to follow me, and I want you to follow me with all of your heart, and I want you to never go back to what I delivered you from. And that's the way it is with our salvation. God says, I've saved you. I've cleansed you. I've sanctified you. I have set you free from that bondage. And you are to never go back. The book of Proverbs says that a person that goes back to his sinful ways is just like a dog returning to his vomit. You don't go back to what God has set you free from. Because he has a future in store for you. He said, if you want to go to that land that is flowing with milk and honey, if you want to experience the blessings that I have from you, if you want to taste that salvation full and free, you put your eyes on me and you don't look back. But you trust in me to guide you in the path that I've chosen for you. The next step, step six, over in Exodus 14, we see that God says, obey me, and you leave the results up to me. So God leads them by the pillar of cloud and fire up to the edge of the Red Sea. They think they're trapped. They think Pharaoh's gaining ground on them. But God says, I'm not finished yet. First of all, I delivered you and protected you with the blood of the lamb. We've got some water to deal with now. He says, there's one more obstacle in your way, and I'm fixing to clear that obstacle so that you'll know that I am your deliverer and that I am with you. And you can't take any credit for your deliverance because I'm doing all the work for you. All you have to do is follow where I direct you. You obey me and you leave the results up to me. Exodus 14 verses 21 through 29 describe the Red Sea crossing. Moses stretched out his hands and his staff. An east wind blew all night long and it parted the Red Sea for them. It says that the Israelites crossed over on dry land. And when the Egyptians tried to follow them, the Lord caused their wheels to fall off of their chariots. They were stuck. And once the Israelites were safely on the other side, God closed the waters back up on the Egyptians. They obeyed God. They followed him in a place where they had never been before. They crossed through the water and they left the results up to him. They didn't have to lift a sword. They didn't have to lift a spear. They didn't have to fight because the Lord fought for them. It was part of his overall plan. 
I know I'm covering a lot of ground right now. We're going to put it all in a nice, neat little package here in just a moment. But follow me for just a few more moments. And last, when he does save you, when he does set you free, when he guides you and he leads you in the path that he has chosen for you, you've got to realize that he and he alone is the one who receives the glory for your salvation and for your deliverance. But it wasn't until after the fact, it wasn't until after God did all these miraculous events that the Israelites truly feared the Lord and believed in him and what he said. He saved Israel so that he could get the glory for it. Exodus chapter 14, look at verse 30. It says, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. God had to take them through all of those events before he could get the respect from the Israelites. And it wasn't until after their deliverance until after the blood was applied to the doorpost and the angel of death passed over their house. It wasn't until after they, uh, Pharaoh said, get out of here, I don't want you no more, you're free. It wasn't until after they crossed through the Red Sea, through the waters of the Red Sea, then and only then when they looked back and they saw the bodies of the Egyptians laying on the shores of the Red Sea, it says right here that it was only then that the people feared the Lord and believed and they believed in his servant Moses as well. In the next chapter, chapter 15, it's all about a psalm that they wrote giving God the glory for their deliverance, for their salvation, for saving them from their 400 years of slavery. So here's the question that I have for you over that whole narrative there of the deliverance of the children of Israel. And I think it's the same question that the psalmist asked in Psalms 106. At what point in that story would you say the salvation of the Israelites actually occurred? Would you say it was the blood on the doorpost that saved them? Would you say it was the waters of the Red Sea that saved them? Would you say it was the miracles that God showed through Moses as their deliverer that saved them? Is there any one point in that entire story that is more important than the other? I would say that they are all critical. I, I would say that the whole thing had to take place because it wasn't until after everything unfolded that they feared and believed the Lord. Which step in that story would you deem as the most crucial or critical or necessary. What, was it the blood or was it the water that saved Israel? Was it their obedience that saved Israel? Was it the directions, the specific steps during that first Passover? I'd say they were all important. But I would have to go back to the blood on the doorpost because God says, when I see the blood, I'll know that you've obeyed me and you've trusted in me. That, that was what started the entire redemptive story for the Israelites in this narrative. When that blood was spilled for that lamb, and when the head of the household took that blood and put it on the doorpost and the lintel, everybody in that household was covered and protected. And then everyone in that household was able to walk freely through the Red Sea after Pharaoh released them. So go into the points in your outline. Where does that fit in in this whole narrative? I, I think in Psalms 106, you can see each and every step. Most of you who are familiar with uh, Martin Luther, the Reformation, some of the great uh, leaders during the, Reform the Protestant Reformation, you've already figured out what each one of these steps represents. 
These are commonly known as the five solas of the Reformation. They are the basics of our faith. And would you be able to say that any one of them is more important than the other? I don't know that you could. So I'm going to give them to you real quick. We're going to talk about it a little bit more here in just a moment. Salvation is by grace alone. Salvation is through faith alone. Salvation is in Christ alone. Salvation is according to Scripture alone. And salvation is for God's glory alone. So where do you see this in Psalms 106? Verse 8. The psalmist talks about their rebellion. The sinfulness of the fathers, how they had committed iniquity. He says, nevertheless, though, in spite of all of that, he saved them. That's a picture of God's grace right there. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, when you are saved, you are saved by grace alone. And that's exactly what the psalmist is laying out here. Salvation is also through faith alone. Down in verse 9, it says that he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. We walk by faith and not by sight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. By faith, by grace, through faith you are saved. And so grace, uh, salvation is also through faith alone because he led them through the depths. And by faith they followed him all the way through the Red Sea. So when these were written out, these were written in the Latin language. By grace alone is sola gratia. Through faith alone is sola fide. We are saved by the grace of God alone. We, we don't understand it. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. But by grace, we accept it. By faith, we accept his grace. And we are saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ through the redeeming work on the cross of Calvary. We have faith that it is sufficient enough to save us. And in verse 10 in Psalms 106, we see that salvation is through Christ alone. And he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Who is your redeemer? His name is Jesus Christ. And he has conquered Satan, he has conquered death, he has conquered hell, and he has conquered the grave. And in this narrative of the Exodus event of the Israelites from Egypt, if Egypt is a picture of sin, then Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. Then Moses would be the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ defeating the enemy and delivering us from the bondage that we are in. Salvation is in Christ alone as our Redeemer and our Savior, and our King. But salvation is also in uh, according to Scripture alone. What is Scripture? When we studied Scripture for three weeks, we learned that it was Theopneustos, God breathed. It is the very words of God himself. In verse 12, the first part of it, it says that they believed his words, and that's what Scripture is. The Bible alone is our highest authority. It's greater than tradition. It's greater than any creed. It is greater than anything written by a human hand. Salvation is according to Scripture alone is our highest authority. And last but not least, that second half of verse 12, you also see this in the second half of verse 8. He saved them for his name's sake. But in verse 12 it says that when they were saved, they believed his words and they did what? They sang his praise. They gave him all the glory for it. We live for the glory of God alone. We are saved for his glory. And this entire narrative of the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea 
That story went on before them because every town they came to, to, it says that they trembled, their hearts melted because they had heard of what God had done for them in the Red Sea and the Exodus event. That's a picture of your testimony. What, what I, I heard about what God did in your life. I've seen the mir- miraculous transformation he's made in you. I've seen some of the things that he has delivered you from. And he and he alone gets the glory for it. All of those things are necessary steps for your salvation. And there is none other than one that is more important than the other. And that is number three. Your salvation is in Christ alone. Because if it wasn't for his atoning death on the cross of Calvary, we could never be delivered. And when God sent his only son in this world, he did it for his glory to save us. And now your life, if you've been born again, your life is a testimony, a living, breathing testimony to the glory of God that he can take a life from nothing and he can make something out of it. Salvation. Several different steps. They're all important. It's by grace alone. It's through faith alone. It's in Christ alone. It's according to Scripture alone. Taking God at his word. And it's for God's glory alone. Now, I I like to do pictures. I like to do illustrations. I like to do demonstrations. Is there any one picture or any one description that you could just summarize salvation in? I I don't think so because there's so many steps involved in it. We think that it's just one step. It starts off with a step of faith. But your salvation is an entire lifelong process that God is working out day in and day out. So how could you demonstrate salvation? Is there any one picture, any one story that you could use for someone's salvation? Let's just, let's do a little role play here. Let's say I'm I'm hiking uh, in the mountains. Let's say I've got my backpack on, I'm alone, I'm by myself. I'm I'm going to each and every uh, scenic overlook and I'm enjoying the views. I'm just enjoying peace. I'm having quiet time with the Lord. I'm seeing all the wildlife and the trees and the foliage. Well, I'm just walking along, and I'm, I'm just enjoying everything it is, and uh, I'm not paying attention to where I'm going. And let's just say I step off into a pit. I'm by myself. I'm trapped. This pit has sheer walls up on it. It's muddy. It's slimy. It's slippery. I'm trapped. I, I can't get out. This isn't where I planned on being. This wasn't on the map. This wasn't on the radar. But somehow or another, I found myself in a place that I can't get out of. So I cry out for help. Hey, is there anyone up there that can help me? I'm trapped. I can't get out. One hour passes by. Two hours pass by. I see that there's no way I'm getting out. There's nothing to cling to. There's nothing to hold on to. I've fallen 15 feet. I can't jump that high. There's no ladder. There's no rope. I'm stuck. I'm in a place that I can't do anything to get myself out of. But I, I've got a higher education. Let's see if this higher education will get. I've got a lot of money in my bank account. Maybe I could buy my way out. Is there anyone that can help me? An entire day goes by. I've already eaten all the snacks in my backpack. I'm getting hungry. I'm getting desperate, and there's no one around, and there's nothing I can do to get myself out of this. What I need is a Savior. What I need is somebody who will hear my cry and respond to my helpless situation. Three days go by. I I can't even try to climb anymore. I can't get out of this pit. No one around for miles. They can't hear my cry for help. I've given up completely because I understand that by my own power, nothing I've done in my past, 
Nothing I'm doing right now will get me out of the situation that I'm in. So I sit down and I give up. I said, well, this is it. It's all over with. I'm never coming out of this pit alive. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, something happens. I can't see out of the edge of the pit. I don't know where it came from. I've been here for three days. I'm starving to death. I'm tired. I'm dehydrated. I've tried everything I could to get out of here. And this is my only hope. I've got two options here. <laughs> I, I can either stay where I'm at or I can trust that whoever threw this rope heard my cry for help and they have my best intentions at heart. Now, if I'm at the bottom of this pit, I can't see who's holding on to it. I say, hey, <laughs> who are you? They say, it doesn't matter. I'm here to save you. All you need to do is hold on to the rope and I'll get you to freedom. I'll get you to safety. I'll pull you out of this pit that you're in. How do I know you can do that? All you got to do is take me at my word. All you have to do is trust me. If you will just hold on to the rope, that's all you have to do. By faith, will you reach out and grab this rope and let me pull you to safety? Okay, I don't know who you are. I can't see you. I've never met you. But I need to get out of here and I don't have any other way out. That's exactly where the Israelites were in Egypt. They were enslaved, they were in bondage, they were in a place that they could not get out of on their own. So God sent a deliverer to them and he said, if you will trust this person, follow my directions and by faith, trust me. Take me at my words, I will deliver you. And so I hold the rope and sure enough, the person on the other end begins pulling I'm holding on with all of my might. And now when I get up there, I don't see anybody. But I know that there was a power greater than myself that provided a way out that I couldn't find on my own. Did I deserve that? Probably not. But by their grace, their mercy, their compassion, they said, I want to help you out of a place that you can't get out of on your own. And by faith, I grabbed hold of the rope. And I took that person at their word because I knew that that was my only possibility of being delivered from the pit I was in. And the end result, whoever you were, I don't know where you went, I don't know what you were, but thank you for saving me. I owe my life to you. Because if it hadn't have been for you, I would have never gotten out of that situation I was in. That's the best way to illustrate salvation that I know of. Is understanding that all you had to do was by faith take God at his word. God, I don't understand it. I, I don't know how you're going to do it. But I trust you to do what only you can do. I don't know where you stand in your relationship with the Lord today. I don't know what kind of pit or bondage you're in. But do you need to grab hold of the rope today? God's made a way. God has made a provision for you to be set free from your sin. And there's only one way. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. So about salvation is through Christ alone. There are many other elements involved in it. It's not that complicated. Don't try to make it more confusing than what it actually is. 
The first thing you need to do is you need to make your cry out for help. God, I'm lost. I'm dying. I'm going to hell because I don't have you in my life and I need you to save me. And according to his word, he will because he's made all of the other provisions for you. I thought it was very interesting that some of the songs we sang talked about the blood and the water. And in our Exodus account that we talked about, what happened? They had to take the blood and they had to apply it to the door, but they also had to pass through the water. Where does that fall into salvation picture? Whenever Jesus breathed his last breath upon the cross, a Roman soldier punctured his side. And it said that the blood and the water came flowing out. And it was at that point that your salvation was secured with the spilling of Jesus Christ's blood. Every drop of blood came out of his body to provide salvation for us. Have you trusted in him today? Has he, has he, throughout your life, been providing a way for you to be saved? And you have yet to take hold of that rope and say, I need you to deliver me. I want to be saved. And I don't want to go back to this lifestyle that I've been living. God, would you help me? Would you set me free? And that's what salvation is all about. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Have you made that step yet in your life? Is today that day that possibly God is calling you to save you and give you his free gift of eternal life? We're all born with a sin nature. We can't help it. It's something we inherited. And that sin nature sets us apart from a holy and just God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Not just a physical death, we're all going to die a physical death, but it also refers to a spiritual death, which is, which is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. But the Bible says to overcome that sin nature, you must be born again. You must be born of a spiritual birth. God's Holy Spirit comes to live within you when you call upon his name. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Just like that rope that was thrown out to the bottom of the pit. That's my gift for you to be set free. But by faith you must take him at his word and lay hold of that gift. A gift is not yours until you accept it. The giver can't force it upon you. But you have to say, I won't your salvation. By faith I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And that point is when you are born again of the Spirit of God. You say, well, Brother Tracy, I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I don't know how to do that. Where do I start? You just pray to Him. In just a moment when the music begins, you say, God, forgive me of my sins. Make me a new person. Help me to walk a new life and save me from my sinful lifestyle. And according to his word, he will do that. So I'm going to say a prayer. And in just a moment when the music starts, if that's a decision that you need to make, come see me. Let's talk. Let's settle it today. Don't leave out of these doors without accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. There's no need to. If you're uncertain of it, you can settle that issue today and you can walk out of this place a new person in Jesus Christ. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your salvation that is full and free. And my prayer, Lord God, is if there's anyone here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be that day They would start a new life. In I pray, Lord.